it's a pleasure today to be part of the Foreign Policy Association's Future of Energy Conference. We've already heard a very thought-provoking speech by the President of the current United States, United Nations General Assembly, and now we're going to move into our panel discussion, uh, the energy picture redrawn. In fact, it's clear the picture of energy in our modern world is anything but a still life. Uh, it's constantly changing landscape that's hard to capture, and even a snapshot that holds for more than a very brief period of time. Uh, from my position at Peabody Energy, uh, the world's largest private sector coal company, I have the opportunity to see a lot of emerging and changing trends uh, in the energy industry, and I've seen a lot of changes in recent years. Let me just offer a few as uh, thought starters for the panelists, uh, starting with oil. Is $100 the new $40? Uh, for years, the price per barrel of oil was $20 to $60 uh, range. Now oil makes headlines whenever it falls below $100. Uh, it's, a new, it's a new plateau on oil pricing. And it's kind of startling when you think about $100 a barrel of oil when we have the economic uh, situation that we have today that's not as robust as we would think it should be for high prices. And the risk premium that used to be embedded you know, as, a, as a thought process into oil is now a base into the oil price. It's buried into the price of oil. Uh, next, what is yours is mine, and what's mine is mine. Uh, energy capitalism and energy imperialism uh, are growing themes. More than ever, a large amount of resources are owned by countries, not companies. And these companies are protect these countries are protecting their assets uh, while acquiring others' countries' resources at the same time from neighboring nations and continents. So something to think about. Uh, the center of energy gravity has moved. Uh, the epicenter for global energy demand is no longer America or Europe, it's Asia. Uh, within my own sector, we look forward for the next 20 years and we see the growth in energy, 90% of the growth in my sector is going to come from Asia. And I think it's very true for all the other energy sectors as well. Most of them are going to see the large amount of their growth is going to come from the Asia market in the next quarter of a century. Natural gas is at an intriguing crossroads. Shale drilling has given natural gas an important new life in the United States, uh, but no energy form can be an island forever. Uh, how long will it be before the international price of oil and gas converge with the low cost that we're seeing today for natural gas in the United States? Uh, what's the future of fracking technologies on a global basis? You know, the practice has been banned in certain countries. Uh, it's evolved far slower than many would have expected. Uh, concerns over water, uh, environmental concerns, geologic concerns, and costs. So th there's you know, a lot happening with this new shift in the gas paradigm. Uh, renewables, uh, very popular, fast growing, but still largely a boutique energy source. Uh, the question is whether the world can advance renewals, renewables at sufficient size and scale and at a cost without subsidies. That, that's it, that's competitive. Nuclear energy was once going to be too cheap to meter. Uh, today, the times have changed. Japan just shut down its last nuclear facility. Europe is trimming back its nuclear facilities. So what's the future of this once you know, very promising energy source as we look forward? I have to talk about coal since I'm in the coal business. Uh, it's, it's been the world's fastest growing fuel for each of the last 10 years. And the projections are that by the International Energy Administration is that coal will be continue to be the fastest growing fuel, and by 2035, coal will pass up oil as the most used fuel in the world. Uh, it, you know, the growth of electricity is expected to be greater than the growth of gas, greater than the growth of oil, nuclear, hydro, and wind combined in the next 25 years. And that's mostly happening in the emerging economies uh, in, in Asia, and it's creating a higher standard of living for all of those economies. So finally, and consistent with remarks made by the President uh, Al Nasir today, energy poverty remains a top global priority. And it's one that we are very, uh, very concerned about. Uh, we look at, there's some 3.6 billion people have no electricity or inadequate access to electricity around the globe. And as you look forward 20 years, there's gonna be another 2 billion people <laughs> added to that uh, profile. Uh, you know, we believe as the president does, that the world's priority should be to eliminate energy poverty, create broad energy access, and continue to install clean energy technologies, including coal generation and sequestration technologies for all types of energy. Uh, the global energy leaders need to dig deep. 
and to help solve this fundamental challenge for world health and prosperity and sustainability. So these are just a few thought starters for the group today, from my perspective, for the panel and the audience to consider. Uh, you've got some background materials. You have the bios of our esteemed panelists today. Uh, I'm sure we all can agree that the background of each of them will make for an exciting discussion around energy. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our panel. We'll begin with some introductory remarks, and then we'll shift into questions. Uh, first, let me start with uh, former Senator Byron Dorgan, Senior Policy Advisor and Co-Chair, Government Relations Practice at Arendt Fox LLP. Sitting, and then Jason Grumet, President of Bipartisan Policy Center. And Nina Henderson, Managing Partner, Henderson Advisory and former Director of Royal Dutch Shell PLC. And I'd like to start the discussion off uh, with the Senator's remarks. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today, and especially with my distinguished panelists. Let me, um, let me first tell you a very short story, and then I'm going to talk to you about uh, what's happening in North Dakota, only because that is disruptive in, from an energy standpoint. Let me tell you about a, a night flying over the Pacific in the old Air Force One, the one that's now parked by the Reagan Library. One of the last trips that plane took uh, was a trip to uh, Asia, Senator Daschle, myself, uh, John Glenn, Pat Leahy, to meet some presidents of China and Japan and uh, Vietnam. And I leaned forward in that president's cabin on old Air Force One and was bearing into John Glenn with some real questions because I'd never had a chance to talk to John, even though I served with him in the Senate, talked, didn't have a chance to talk to him about that first flight around the earth in which this man in a in Freedom 7, the, uh, the capsule not much bigger than a 50-gallon drum, <coughs> circled the earth. And I said, John, one of the things I read about that flight was as you went to the dark side of the earth, the, all the residents of Perth, Australia, decided to turn on every light in Perth, Australia to signal this lone astronaut flying above the planet. I said, did you see those lights? And he said, oh, I really did. He said, they told me that it was going to happen. When I was on the dark side of the earth, I looked down and saw this shining light from Perth, Australia. And I was thinking about that in the context of someone flying above the earth, uh, an astronaut in a capsule looking down on the dark side. The only evidence of human habitation mm -hmm. is the product of using energy, isn't it? I was thinking about that when you talked about energy poverty. Who has it? Who doesn't? Where is it? Where isn't it? So energy is so important in our daily lives. Every day before we get started, really, we use energy a dozen times. Never think about it. The only reason we would think about it is if it wasn't there and available to us. Let me talk just for a moment now about some things that are happening in our country uh, that are disruptive in a positive way. I'm going to tell you about North Dakota. And I could talk about the international scene and so on and so forth. But let me just talk to you about North Dakota. Uh, right now, today, uh, in North Dakota, there are 206 drilling rigs, and they're each drilling, they're drilling one well per month per rig. That's 2,400 new oil wells each year in North Dakota. And it's not searching for oil. They don't drill dry holes because they know exactly where the shale is. They've done core samples. And so they only drill into circumstances where they know that they hit the shale. Now, here's how sophisticated it is. With, with a drilling rig, very sophisticated computerized drilling rig, they're going down searching for a 100-foot seam of shale 10,000 feet under the earth. They're searching for the middle third of a 100-foot seam. So they drill down. When they find that middle third of the 100-foot seam, in that 30-foot space, they then make a big curve and follow that middle third out for two miles. So the same rig drills down two miles, makes a curve, and out two miles. And the sophistication of finding that middle third is unbelievable. They could find a basketball down there. And so once they, once they get down there and do that, then they do what's called hydraulic fracturing, which you've just mentioned. Under very high pressure, they'll put sand and water and various things into that bore. And two, three grains of sand under very high pressure up into the fissure of a piece of shale will cause enough of, of, a, of a space for the oil to drip. And then the oil comes out, they pump it, and we've got 2,400 new oil wells pumping in North Dakota as of a year, so year after year. 
It's unbelievable. And it's changed everything. That's just North Dakota and oil. We just passed Alaska as the number two producer. We produce more than Oklahoma, for example. Uh, and, and so that's the oil story in the Bakken in one area. But it's a story that also is replicated by the natural gas, Marcellus, and other areas. And although oil is now $100 a barrel, and so they make a lot of money. What I'm talking about in North Dakota is Sweet Light Crude, the best oil. They make a lot of money pulling that oil up. But they, they're not interested in the natural gas because it costs too much to gather it. So a researcher in England was looking at the night photographs from the space station, 240 miles above the Earth, and you can see the cities. And I don't know what he was doing, but he was looking for things. And he saw Minneapolis-St. Paul. He saw the lights of Sioux Falls and Fargo and Bismarck. Then he saw a mystery city on the northern plains. <laughs> Didn't know what it was. It was the Bakken, 200,000 acres, the biggest oil play, I think, in the world right now. And the flaring of natural gas from all these wells where they're pulling out oil but getting rid of the gas by burning it. So what I'm saying to you is there are things happening that represent the impact of the highly improbable. You know, the, the, uh, the book that was written, uh, uh, The Black Swan. Mm -hmm. This truly is the impact of the highly improbable. Uh, five years ago, FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, warned America of the impending shortage of natural gas and we'd better figure out what to do to import a lot of natural gas. Five years later, we are awash in natural gas. The impact of the highly improbable. This is good news, but it doesn't mean that we ought to take our eye off of the ball on so many other important issues. Renewables, transmission, coal, especially research, which I think represents our future in energy as well. So there's a lot going on, and I, I've, I've just narrowed what I talked to you about just because I wanted you to understand what's happening in, in this very specific area of coal and especially natural gas as well with uh, hydraulic fracturing. But there's a lot of good news out there, but a lot of challenges as well. Okay, well great, let's move on now to uh, uh, Jason Grumain. Thank you, Richard. So Richard started off, I think, with the um, comment that energy policy is not a still life. And if you have been watching this little art history uh, for the last years, you probably think it's an Escher drawing. Because as Senator Dorgan <laughs> indicates, we are in such a profoundly different place sitting here today than we could have been even four years ago. And what I want to try to do is you know, put a little bit of architecture around, um, I think, the kind of optimistic frame that, that Senator Dorgan offered. And just give you a little bit of my sense of you know, where we were four years ago, where we find ourselves, and, and where we might be heading. Um, I should just say a moment about the Bipartisan Policy Center. I don't, I don't believe in objectivity, but I think transparency is important. Uh, we were founded five years ago by former Senate Majority Leaders uh, Baker, Dole, Daschle, and Mitchell. We have a wide array of projects where we try to rediscover the lost art of uh, principled compromise. We believe in politics. We are bipartisan. We try to bring proud and pragmatic partisans like Senator Dorgan together and have a group of experts come together and hash out difficult policy compromises. And so we have an energy project that the Senator is co-chairing for us along with uh, former Senator Trent Lott, with Bill Riley, who was the former EPA administrator, featured prominently in the front page of today's New York Times, and General Jim Jones, former Supreme Alley Commander, National Security Advisor. We just had the pleasure of meeting yesterday. So if Senator Dorgan and I seem like we are very well coordinated, it is um, because we prepared for this speech for the last 10 hours. Um, so here's my basic frame. I think since the um, oil embargo, our nation has basically been managing um, weakness when it comes to energy policy. That, that's been the ultimate imagination behind what we've been trying to do. I think we are now at a unique moment where we have the opportunity to try to manage success, which I think is actually much harder than managing weakness. It's much more optimistic, it's more fun, but in fact, um, it is not at all easy to do, particularly uh, in a market-driven economy. And let me just kind of lay out a little bit of background for you. So the last time we passed really energy policy of significance was in 2005, and this gentleman deserves a tremendous amount of credit for that. It was the first major reauthorization of energy policy in about 15 years. And we had a follow-up bill in 2007. And the incentives that I believe pushed Congress to act at the time were we are out of natural gas. We are driving manufacturing offshore. It is not coming back because natural gas costs three times more in the U.S. than other places. And I can still hear Andrew Liveris, his voice in my head, uh, chairman of Dow Chemical, saying we are investing $12 billion in the next five years and not a single penny of it in the United States because of natural gas. That was, in my mind, the most powerful motivator 
to force Congress to think we needed to address energy policy. So it was scarcity. Profligate waste, just an energy economy that was going to consume and consume and consume with no end in sight and a sense that we just really did not have our arms around the intensity of energy use in the economy. This constant sense of just dependence, that we were just in this vicious cycle of ever increasing dependence on oil, in many cases from countries that don't harbor many of our ideals or best interests and there seemed to be no end in sight, and that the world was on the verge of a real meaningful compromise that was going to move forward a global carbon policy and we were being left out. I think those were the four ideas that had motivated what then became, I think, some very good energy policy. Those energy bills increased fuel economy standards, they invested in energy efficiency, they provided significant R&D resources for advanced coal technology, they tried to deal with some of our infrastructure issues, and they were good bills. They enjoyed 75 and 86 votes, respectively, in the U.S. Senate. Seems like a long time ago that you could see legislation that can get 75 or 86 votes in the U.S. <laughs> Senate. But I would suggest going forward that energy policy has always been a place that has that potential. And I think we can get there again. We then had the presidential election during very high oil prices. And you'll remember the drill baby drill chants. President Obama um, is actually kind of an energy guy. Right? He comes from Illinois, which is the crossroads of coal, nuclear, biofuels. He does not bring forward the kind of caricature that a lot of people would like to ascribe to traditional you know, progressive politicians. Um, and when he took office, I think he had an imagination that he was going to try to create a different kind of new consensus. It was based on the same old information, but the way he was going to frame the issues, I saw four parts of that policy. Technology, something that Democrats and Republicans have always felt reasonably good about, that there's a, a real role for limited government in partnership with the private sector and technology breakthroughs. So the stimulus had a very significant amount of resources invested in new energy technology. Market-based approaches and climate change, right? Senator McCain, Senator Obama both really agreed to the basic framework of a, a carbon strategy, and I think the president thought that there would be an opportunity for a bipartisan presence there going forward. Increased domestic oil production on the OCS. That was the idea on the production side. This was going to be largely an OCS play. Um, and the president had tried, even during the campaign, to indicate support for opening up more of the outer continental shelf. And domestic nuclear production. And that was, you could probably hear the political balance in that platform. So review with me quickly. The stimulus, not so bipartisan after all, right? The idea of investing significant public resources and technology has become very divisive. The climate debate was um, quite a debacle, and we could have a much longer conversation about why that happened, but I would suggest to you simply that um, the two institutions that one has to trust to embrace an economy-wide, market-based program to address this invisible thing called climate is the government and the banks. Neither of those two institutions were doing particularly well in gendering public confidence in 2010. Um, and then from there, the whole thing spiraled upon itself. Um, but that obviously has fallen apart. Domestic oil production, Macondo. Domestic nuclear production, Fukushima. Right? This guy couldn't get a break. I mean, every time that the federal government tried to embrace something, it literally blew up. So um, we entered this discussion a few years ago looking at the fact that there really was very little narrative to frame what we thought was a productive energy conversation. What we're trying to do in this project is see if we can put together the basis of a good disagreement, if nothing else. Right? Until you have a good fight, you have no potential of having a good outcome. And I would argue there are three dynamics now that I think are shaping the debate going forward. We have lots of gas, we have surprisingly low domestic energy demand, and we have no money. That's the box. All right, This natural gas thing is real. Right now it costs two dollars. It doesn't make money. You actually cannot make money most places producing natural gas, what they call dry gas. What's happening now is we're moving away, from, we're shutting down those wells and starting to produce the liquids and the oils which are very profitable. But the equilibrium price for natural gas is probably four to six bucks. I mean, it's, it, there's a very strong rationale to think we are not going to see prices creating back up to twelve and thirteen dollars. And if you don't believe me, ask the folks who are investing billions of dollars in new manufacturing facilities in the U.S. They think about that stuff a lot. You don't plant a new four billion dollar manufacturing facility predicated upon natural gas if you don't have a basic confidence that there's a different dynamic there. But here we go to managing success. This is terrific. But if we have an economy that only relies on natural gas, that's a brittle economy. That is not an economy that is going to be capable of addressing the kinds of uh, black swan's future. Um, so we have to manage that. The lower than expected energy demand is good and bad. It buys time. It demonstrates efficiency. We have made tremendous gains in reducing the intensity of energy in our economy. The downside is that new demand brings new technology. And so if we, don't, if we have very low-cost natural gas around one fuel, we don't have a lot of demand, very little space in the marketplace 
for these new technologies to come give you the kind of diversity that you need. And this is why um, Richard and others are making a lot of progress starting to export energy. A fundamental new dynamic for the next 10 years is thinking about the United States not as a weakened importer of energy in a kind of impoverished hydrocarbon nation, but actually one of the largest energy producers in the world. We, in fact, today are one of the largest energy producers in the world. The potential that we will be exporting not just coal, not just natural gas, but actually finished petroleum products, and that that becomes actually an aspect of our strengthening trade um, posture in the world, I think is a very real one, and totally unanticipated up to five years ago. But then finally, let me just close on this, we're broke. Um, as you've noticed, right? <laughs> 15 trillion bucks. Um, we are going to be going through a period of national austerity for, I think, the next decade. And it's going to fundamentally dominate the space in which our national government debates these issues. And so I'll just end with two thoughts. Energy subsidies are going to be on front and center in the conversation we have about broad-based tax reform. I think energy policy in the next Congress will largely be tax policy. You're not going to see very much potential to talk about anything that not one way or other has really addressed the larger deficit dynamic. And so I think there is a real opportunity, hopefully to have a more intelligent discussion that looks at all the different investments in energy and tries to figure out, are we, are we doing them efficiently? You know, this should not be a question of is oil good or coal good or wind good. They're all good. The question is, what does the taxpayer want to be doing to try to advance them? And what's the natural arc of that rational public partnership? And then finally, um, on climate change, uh, it's a real problem. We do not have a uh, idea right now in the Congress that's motivating a consensus solution. Um, I don't see one evolving anytime soon if it is driven by ecology. If we try to convince the Congress that this is, and I do believe it is a significant global threat, but I think the legitimate questions about what our actions are going to do to solve the problem vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world um, are you know, complicated, uh, not easily resolved. But if you take out a sharp pencil and try to figure out how to deal with the deficit, um, we got to raise some revenue. There's, there's absolutely no way to do this without raising some revenue, and everybody knows it, even people without sharp pencils. Um, when it comes to taxing stuff, everything's on the table. And you know, the last time we raised energy taxes in this country, it was a tax on gasoline of 4.3 cents, I think. Anybody know why it was 4.3 cents? You think that there was an externality analysis that determined that this was, in fact, a legit? That was the gap in the budget. Right. They needed the money. They needed 4.3 cents. And you know, the only way that I think you'll see energy and carbon pricing move forward in the near term is based on the incredible compulsion that we now have to do and find different ways to raise revenue. And so I think that's a complicated and it's a hard conversation to have. It's a conversation that makes Richard and all the people who are part of the energy infrastructure very concerned. Um, but I think it's a real conversation if it's done in that larger question about broad-based tax reform. So I will. Turn it over to you, Nina. <laughs> OK. So I'm the wrap-up person. So I'm going to try to uh, knit together all of what we've heard uh, from Pre uh, President Alistair. We started in the um, world global environment to the best we could in the time period we had. We've had some great insight into the US. We've had some terrific insight into a US internet and global player in terms of an energy uh, operator. And what I thought I would try to do here is just state the obvious. You know, the energy landscape is perennially dynamic. There's actually, if you think about it, throughout all of history, whatever it was, whether it was burning wood or whatever, it was always dynamic. And we're yet at another dynamic period. And right now, I think the day, today what we see and what we see going through in the, in the near term and most likely in the long term is a continual dynamism. And it's reshaping now for two reasons, in my opinion, and a lot of things lump under this, but technology and the expectations of demand and access. And I emphasize the word, the expectations. I'm going to come back to both of those points. In the area of technology, you know, we now see many things um, as the, the senator and as Jason has pointed out and as Rick has pointed out, we have now technology that allows us to go after resources that we thought were over with. They were dead. They had matured. We now have built abilities to go back to oil wells that are onshore and classic ones from generations ago and repump what was remaining there. We have technology that provides resources from sources that we once thought were unreachable. Horizontal drilling, which, we, which was a great description of what happens. And there are many other examples. I'm just going to, for time, hit on one or two. 
technology which enables us finding resources that seem to be almost at the center of the earth. All of these issues of, of seismic uh, imaging and multi-dimensional ability to pinpoint exactly where the resource is, whether it's oil out in an ocean, whether it's gas in a shell, uh, geological formation, uh, whether it's coal in a deep, in a seam, in a, you know, we could go on. We have technology now that allows us to get out there and really make estimates. This, we used to have to guess, in a way, you know, the divining fork. That we do not have, and we're improving those all the time. We have evolving, te evolving technologies that offer hope for additional resources. You know, Rick is right, a lot of the renewables and alternative energy, and, and called by a lot of other names, are also really, at this point in time, still quite boutique. They have their role. There's nothing wrong with them. They're very expensive. And as you said, they don't last without subsidy, uh, subsidies. But we've got a lot of other emerging ones. Nanotechnology for batteries. You can t make these super capacitators create um, uh, energy off of incredible things that we can't even see and slicing and dicing uh, the whole chemical chart, shall we say. Ocean power. You know, who's to say that there isn't the wave power and so on and so forth? Am I suggesting that this business is captive na now and we know how to do this or that it's affordable? No, not in the least. But I think the important thing here is that technology and innovation, a word that we've used, is absolutely crucial as we proceed forward because we will not deal with the whole issue of expectation of demand and access without it. But as Jason points out, the key thing is you've got to have investment for that. It costs money. And often you invest and you try things and you research things and it doesn't work. So the fact of the matter is we can't shy away from investing and trying things because something didn't work. We have to pick up and move on and do that and we have to find the funds to do this in a public-private partnership and across borders because we are not going to solve these technological problems unless we have the guy from the UK who's on the space shuttle who happens to be a scientist and says, ooh, idea. We need ideas. We need education to teach more scientists, more engineers, more people with understandings of these things to make this happen. And we need to make the investment in that. And we need to work out getting the money through revenue generation, through the willingness to take a back seat to some activities. And many of the for-profit company, for example, are underwriting many of these things. And we, we need to recognize that they need to make money off what they're currently doing in order for them to continue to make these investments. It's absolutely pivotal. We can't kill that horse, and we can't kill the government's ability to raise revenue to invest in this kind of research. I'd like to move a little bit to demand, expectations, and access. You know, we've got the demand, as we've already touched on, for commercial and industrial, and everyone in this audience can make all sorts of examples of the need for power to generate manufacturing plants, to generate electricity, to generate um, uh, research labs, to generate um, hospitals to cure uh, sick people, et cetera, et cetera. So there's many, many utilizations a need for commercial and industrial use of that, to say nothing of finding the resource, which in and of itself takes a lot of energy. But then you have the man and the woman on the street in every part of the world. And they all have demand expectations. And they believe they should have access. And frankly, they're right. None of us could stand in the way of having someone have access. But it isn't that easy because, of course, they're not necessarily distribution systems. They're not necessarily the resource. And they can't afford to pay for it. So the question becomes, how can you create access by these constituencies? Who owns it? Who can use it? And at what price? Because everybody has to pay a price on this, even the poorest. We have to make it as inexpensively as possible. But everybody needs to have skin in the game so that they feel that what they're getting, they are valuing. Who has the responsibility to supply? And who assures the ecosystem balance? These are all like major, major questions that we need to work together on, or we're not going to have it. Private governments, the United Nations as an enabler, I mean, these, you know, and other cross international groups. Now, this sounds like, you know, oh my, Kumbaya and Pollyanna here, but it's actually realistic in a way as to what has to be done. Now, how we enable that is a very difficult challenge, a very difficult challenge. And I know that many of you. You know, when, you, when we talk about that man and woman on the street, and I know many of you have traveled internationally uh, for business or in terms of, you know, just of interest and so on. And, you know, when you go into a hut 
in uh, parts of um, Africa, in Nigeria, and you see a woman over a, a stone, uh, over a, um, uh, a cooking uh, stove, which is a can with some wood chips and everything, which is spewing out incredibly horrible things in terms of emissions, a technical word, but what's really happening in practice, you know, and they're getting sick, and their children are getting sick. You say to yourself, well, there's a cost on that health issue, too. So it's the connecting of these dots. When you go and you see everywhere, and for many years now, many of you who have traveled in, in different parts of Asia, I hate the word Asia because it's such a, a huge group of people and huge group of different cultures. But frankly, the cell phone, you know, we, we think, oh, well, the cell phone is ubiquitous everywhere, as we all know. And now it's smartphone, cheaper smartphones. I'm not talking about iPads and things like that, but I'm talking about a lot of utility. And yes, even where the person doesn't really own it, and they buy, they, they rent it or purchase it from a hut, they rent it from a hut at a kiosk, but the kiosk has to use energy to regenerate that and fill that battery up, so they bring it back. Even the person on the street with that inexpensive cell phone that they rent is consuming energy. And everybody wants it, the I want phenomenon. And it will never go away because we're all humans. And now, they all, even if they don't have access to the internet, they all have it on their phones. They all have it in every kind of cafe. They can all buy, you know, in internet cafes in our part of the world look a lot different than they are, as you all know, in other parts of the world. They're little hovels where you can go in and do your thing. Some others are much more sophisticated. But everybody has access. They can see what, everything, what everyone else is, is happening, what's happening, what they want. They can see what other people have, and they want it too. And you also, I think, need to say to yourself, electricity. We, we touched on that, and even all of us, many dimension of the word electricity. You know, there was a time when the world was lit by fire only. And they were the dark ages. And in point of fact, in order to have people learn and feel better and do well and come up with new technology and be able to function in society, they need electricity. They need light on to make sure that they can read. They need light on to power whatever they have that can be an, uh, an educational instrument. So without it, we are dooming ourselves to having huge swathes of population as drains to their own countries and then to broader countries. So electricity is absolutely crucial. And we have to be willing to accept a wide range of resources that support the development of electricity so that from the air, you can see that. You can see many more places lit up. However, you know, all energy is not available on a continuous withdrawal basis. It's like the bank, you know, you've got to put something in so it comes out again. I mean, you can't just keep taking away from it. And you can't just do it without a recognition of how that impacts the existence of life and the quality of life. And so we have to, again, work on ways in which we can extract and supply energy that does it in a way that doesn't undermine the quality of life. Water, air, land. And we simply need to keep focusing on that. I thought your story was wonderful, Senator. I had the opportunity once to uh, several times, but on one particular trip, it was during the daylight. I was coming from Sakhalin Island, which is that island in the Japanese uh, train. It's, an, it's a Russian island, very north part of that, in the very far uh, reaches of uh, the Pacific, right along the coastline there, separated by a bay. I flew back uh, to um, London aboard a plane, a small plane, small jet, uh, and it was a bright day. And I had an old-fashioned atlas, not my iPad, in front of me so I could see what I was flying over. And it was a crystal day. And I looked down at one point, and I flew over Lake Bacal. Now, this was a jet. That lake was under me a long time. And that is fresh water. And you say to yourself, gee, you know, it, it's Russia, Canada, and the United States with the largest resource of water. And everything affects what we do with water. Everything affects with what we do with what we breathe. And I think, you know, often industry gets a bad name as if they're not paying attention to this. Most industry does try <coughs> and does effectively try to control what happens because they realize they're not an island of themselves. I think all of us, if we stop and think, it'd be a good idea to shut off the water when we're brushing our teeth, you know. But we all have to start thinking, even on that kind of really tiny, tiny level about this, because everybody else in the world believes, and as they should, that they are entitled to clean water, electricity, and land. 
and they want as many gadgets as we have. They want refrigerators, they want cars, they want phones, and who are we to say that they can't have them? So this is an interesting quandary, and I think that the reality of this is that it's a staggering challenge. It's one that's going to exist. But through time, we've always figured out ways as human beings to make something happen here. So I think the landscape has to continue to be redrawn, and we all have to be open to considering new things. And we all have to accept sometimes when things didn't go <coughs> as well as we planned. And maybe some kind of a technology did things we didn't plan on, didn't want to have happen. But if they hadn't tried it, we wouldn't have known. So I think, Rick, uh, you know, I hope that sort of takes all the different points here uh, and tries to pull it together for um, an engagement with all of, all of you. I think, that, I think that was great. I think, uh, you know, we've got to give the, the panelists first before we go to Q&A uh, a round of applause. For the my a lot of good, a lot of good comments, and it clearly uh, hit the topic very well about you know the energy picture has been redrawn. It's changing on a daily basis. Uh, maybe I'll start with one question, then we'll move to the audience. And I, and I just, I guess it's the questions for the senator and as well as for Jason. As we talked about, you know what's happening in North Dakota becoming such a large uh, producer of oil and gas, and that's happening throughout the United States. Uh, the view is, in fact, that in the next several years, the United States can be independent mm -hmm. uh, and we will be an exporter. Uh, can, but do we believe that we actually can export? Do we have the, with the administration that we have and the policies that we have, will they allow us to be an exporter wow. of energy? Well, well, first of all, your comment, the view is. Uh, <laughs> you know, we don't have a view, really, that, is, that, is, that we're, we're very confident of. We go back four or five years again, as I said, when the view was we were going to be dramatically short of natural gas. So the view at the moment is that we're going to be awash in energy. Great deal of uh, new oil production, natural gas uh, production, and, and uh, Jason alluded to it that, that you know, some people believe that we'll have natural gas at $2 or $2.5 in MCF as far as the eye can see. Well, that, that's not going to happen. I mean, it's just not going to be the case. So a lot of things are going to change. and, and uh, so. Uh, we are going to have, however, related to your question, a robust debate, I think, in this country about the export of uh, perhaps oil and natural gas going forward. When you have in Asia and Europe prices on natural gas that go from, you know, 8 and $10 to $16 in MCF, and we've got an abundant natural gas here at $2 or $2.5 in MCF, uh, there's going to be a dramatic pull to have some of that move into uh, international commerce. And uh, so, yeah, I think there's going to be a robust debate. I, wouldn't, I, I don't think the issue is so much this administration. I, th this administration, as uh, I, I think uh, Jason indicated, has uh, an energy policy. It's been a pretty good energy policy. I know there's a lot of politics around this, and I won't, I won't go into answering all these things. But this administration is, has had a pretty good set of policies. Uh, and I don't think that uh, that the administration should be singled out from, from a, a future administration. I think there will always be, in this country, the American people debating, uh, given the fact that we've been so dependent on oil from outside of our country, you know, 60%, now it's down to about 45% or so, uh, and a desire to be less dependent and therefore less vulnerable, have more energy security and therefore more national security, Given that, and given the discussion around that for many, many years now, there will inevitably be a debate about the export. But I do think we will be exporting in the future. The question is under what conditions and how, and the quantity. Yeah. Okay. So, just being the World Affairs <coughs> Council, I must have a, a moment on the global realities of the oil market. Right. Thank you. And then I'm sure we need to <laughs> compile on. So, tremendous national security imperative to have greater control over our own energy destiny. Right? There's just no question that we are very vulnerable right now. And I think that picture is going to get better. Um, and I think it's conceivable that you could see there being about as much oil being produced in North America as being used in North America. So if you look at what is happening with the uh, oil sands in Canada and the new opportunities here domestically, uh, we, you know, we could come to a place where we really were reasonably self-sufficient. But please don't confuse that with economic protection. We have a global oil price. The price of oil in exporting countries and importing countries is the same. When the you know, truckers in Great Britain parked in the middle of the road and said, you know, hell no, we won't go because of diesel prices, Great Britain was an exporting nation. 
the reason we have different oil prices and different gas and prices is taxes and subsidies the only way we actually protect the economy from price shocks in oil is if we use less oil and if we produce more oil we have a greater cushion in the global marketplace so i think u s with the third largest oil producing nation in the world we have a shot at being number two and if we add a couple of more million barrels every two or three years to the hundred million barrel global market we'll be doing our fair share for the global economy and the good people in all those countries in asia will be desperately appreciative but there is no fortress america when it comes to the economy and oil so there has to also be a diversity approach to thinking about our transportation system our transportation system is ninety seven percent reliant on oil our economy will be vulnerable any time something unhappy happens in an oil producing nation in the world. And so we have to kind of recognize both of those two attributes. But since the argument, it, since one of the issues is that we're swimming in gas right now, and likely it looks like we will continue to do so, uh, the reality is just like oil, it, these are global markets. You know, there is a price here for gas, there is a price in, in Europe for gas, and so on and so <coughs> forth. But I do agree with Rick that at some point that's going to get much closer together. The other reality, you can't ask a commercial operation to invest in money and ask all of its investors and so on to provide money to produce something and then not have a market for it. And if in the U.S. we don't have full utilization of that resource that we've produced, we'd be crazy not to be exporting it and selling it to make sure that we can bring the money back in to continue to produce it for our own needs. So these markets don't work independently, as we all know. I mean, this is how you make money to be able to invest and how you would be willing to open up yet another field, whether it be gas, oil, coal, or try to figure out some way to farm algae and turn it into something that doesn't, you know, become crazy. So it's, it's just realistic. I mean, and I, the thought that we would in any way, shape, or form try to eat it, how we would sell or how we would uh, eliminate, you know, pull back on exports, heck, in every other industry without exports right now, we have a little trouble. Right. If I might just add to that to say they are in fact global markets but not free markets. Right. Very big difference. A substantial amount of oil is owned by and controlled by sovereign nations. And uh, you know you, you have a, a cartel yep. uh, that produces a substantial amount. So they are not free markets. And one of the things that Jason just barely touched on is, uh, and I think going to be a significant question, with respect to transportation in this country, will we migrate to a, a, a very quickly to an electric uh, fleet. vehicle future, mm -hmm. natural gas uh, uh, fleet future? I, I don't. I, I'm a big fan of electric vehicles, and and introduced the Electric Vehicle Deployment Act to try to move it along. But all of the, you know, a good number of these kinds of changes will also have profound impacts on the amount of uh, oil we use. Absolutely. Let's take questions from the audience. Yes. Following up on this discussion and the transportation market, really, if you look at the monopoly oil has in the transportation market, it's not too different from the way AT&T controls the local loop and long distance until it's broken up. We talked a little bit about perhaps passing some bill to open up the car platform to take alternative fuels and then let the free market compete for those fuels, and specifically the methanol that can be produced from natural gas to be put into our car platform at a very attractive price, even at six dollars an MCS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I, yeah, you know, I think there are a lot of things being looked at now that could power an automobile or leave airplanes out of it for a moment, but powering an automobile. You've described one that's um, can be pretty effective. Part of the issue, of course, of course, is the is the distribution and how people would gain the product into the vehicle, how they would renew the product, et cetera. And this becomes, uh, it's not, it doesn't say it's a complete impediment, but it wouldn't be solved simply by breaking up the monopoly on the, shall we say, the first level resource. It also has to be who's going to distribute it, who's going to allow the refilling, who's going to allow that kind of, I go back to when automobiles first came out and. Uh, there were blacksmiths and bicycle shops. Eventually the bicycle shops figured out they would be the ones that would handle the cars. But I think it's the same thing here. We need to keep the same amount of investment in time on what the parallel distribution system would be in order to make those things realistic and be able to do volume and scale. 
the only thing I would say is that until about three years ago, oil and gas prices were generally in harness. Mm -hmm. And so there was not a profound economic rationale to make the hundreds of billions of dollars of investment for, for new mm -hmm. infrastructure. A lot of very smart people now think that these two commodities are going to be fundamentally differently priced. And at, at, you're right, 5 or $6 in MCF compared to $100 a barrel oil, there's a tremendous economic incentive for natural gas fueling. I think we'll see the big <coughs> fleets, the heavy-duty diesel vehicles, transition over to natural gas. The economics are better. The infrastructure challenges are smaller. And if that works well, I think you'll see the car companies taking yeah. this yeah. very seriously. They're clearly taking electrification very seriously. Um, so I, I would expect in 10 years we're going to start to see commercial scale penetration of more electric cars and certainly in the heavy duty fleet natural gas. Yes. Anybody comment on the LNG export approval process? I just, I don't know. I'm just wondering why only Chanel has the, um, uh, to export facilities. The question was the uh, LNG terminal export question. What, what's the process for approval? Uh, you know, frankly, I don't know the, the full process for approval, but the, 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 it is interesting that uh, had we had this discussion in this room five years ago, your question would have been about the facilities being built for import, because there was right. an urgency that we for build the loading. facilities for, for import. For offloading, yeah. Now, now some of the same uh, uh, companies that were building for import have decided, you know what, <laughs> Now that we've uh, discovered these new natural gas fines, we need to try to think through how would we cr uh, change those facilities for export. I don't know the specific approval. There, there are, well, I think, nine major facilities in, yeah. in the approval process now. Um, many of them are rather ambivalent proposals. These are multi-billion dollar facilities, and they need to have guaranteed purchasers before they're going to take that next step. So I, I don't get the sense that you have the federal government as an obstacle at the moment. It's a very you know, energetic, well, just, just give us the permit and we're ready to go. I think we're starting now a, a national permitting conversation that's going to probably go on for five or six years. But there are also state overlays for the very heavy-duty state overlays, as there are, frankly, for every type of energy for uh, liquefied natural gas terminals, which was the ability to offload gas coming to our country. Now, to switch it around, it's a similar kind of thing, but it costs a lot of money. You have to go through each state, and it gets particularly intriguing when it's in a water basin, let's say, because most of these try to stay offshore, um, and they're so offshore that they are a pretty small footprint compared to, for example, all the wells we see in lots of other situations. It's a pretty small footprint in terms of an infrastructure. But if it goes between a waterway where it's between two states, it's very interesting because one state may have you know, the um, approval process, but the other state wants to input. And then you have the federal government. So you've got lots of issues. It's pretty rigorous in this country, very rigorous. That's right. I think the permitting process in the United States is as is, is, is rigid and rigorous as any place in the world, and for good reason, and in, in many reasons. Uh, that's why they do that. And, but it's, it's likely that you're not going to see any significant exports of, of LNG out of the United States for five years. It, it just That's the process. That's how long it takes to do something to really permit anything in the U.S. to, to an extent. Uh, but the, the senator's right. Those same facilities were the ones that were being built to bring in gas <laughs> when, we were, when we didn't have enough gas, and now we're, we're trying to turn them around and now to export gas. So things have changed quite a bit. But uh, it, So it, we won't raise gas prices as quickly as we'd like. Gas prices will raise for sure. From the, they won't stay at $2. They'll need to be you know, 4 to $6 or some number like that. But I think they have, as you said, in the U.S., they are disconnected from oil probably forever uh, on the international market. Oil prices are much more closely linked to oil prices. Rick, there's a lot in the back. Yeah, let's go back. Yeah, somebody in the back, yes. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the regional aspects of um, in the um, in the world of um, specifically trends in natural gas. Um, pertaining to exploration in the Eastern Mediterranean and um, South and Central Asia from the stands to Pakistan and India, um, and perhaps a little bit about um, oil in Iran and what the future um, may look like for countries to which it supplies. Do we have two hours? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question, but it's, it's a syllabus. <laughs> okay. well, you're probably the most oh. knowledgeable. 
Yeah. Well, no, I, I've ruined a lot of shoes climbing on in those places and, and so on, <laughs> uh, which have been great fun. I've, I've welcomed every moment. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of resource in a lot of locations, as you've just pointed out. And of course, the big issue is that in, those, uh, in a lot of those locations, the government believes that that is their resource and it's their property. So um, there's always the conflicting issue of how you get investment to from, you get it from the government, but you also have to have people who know how to do the farming of it, shall we say. And so often you have to invite in many other players to do the actual development. So it's not uncommon, for example, on any of these large projects, whether it's oil, mm. gas, or coal, to have many people in it, three or four major corporations and the government's national company in there doing the development. They all take pieces, they all, and sometimes it's also a bank in there. So there's four or five groups because these things cost billions of dollars and they take time. So in each one of these instances, you always end up with a lot of, um, of negotiating and time to put in place who will operate the activity, who will support it, what the rules of engagement will be, how you interact with all the indigenous groups of people and the local communities, because always the bane of these things is that the local community is the most affected, then the people in a broader area, so there's a whole series of activities that have to happen. So you, you've talked about a real wide range of resources. There's a lot of natural gas out there. It's sourced in different ways depending on what the geological formation is. And we would have to take each one of those locations and, and separate that out. I'm, I'm not trying to go away from your question. I'm just being realistic. Uh, the, the, the Iranian situation, of course, has got many dimensions to it. Um, recently, uh, they had announced that uh, from a pure standpoint of resource now, we'll try to stay away from the whole um, political, socioeconomic situation going on there. But you know, Iran does rely on its oil and gas fields dramatically for its domestic budget. It's a very important aspect of their ability to uh, live and exist and to compete. There's been a lot of things that cause that, but I, I have recently uh, read some material to say that there is some reduction in their production right now, but they do have a lot of other markets other than the West where they can sell that product. So it will remain to be seen um, what happens in terms of their uh, contribution to the world oil and gas uh, marketplace and the amounts of it at this point. But I think to go further, we need a lot more time, and um, it's probably not appropriate to discuss how we view the Iranian situation. Mr. President? Yeah. Uh, I listen carefully to the the discussion, and I have a good question, which uh, <laughs> we we did nothing. Good question, <laughs> and, and I hope you will uh, you will answer that because it's uh, concern. As uh, last month, I organized a thematic debate. Uh, the President of Dominican Republic, who is really taking an international initiative discussing <coughs> commodities. Mm -hmm. And part of that is oil prices, which reflect negatively on any countries, any region, sub-regions uh, plan of the development. And uh, so uh, the, uh, it's very surprising that today we see the oil prices it's above hundred dollars. Okay. Well, the prices goes up if there is a big uh, demand. But today we see in the market uh, more supply than demand. On the same time, the oil prices is going up. Why? <laughs> First, who is behind this? Is it governments? charging more taxes, brokers, some funds. <clears throat> I think what's happening today, really, while we live in a, in a world with fragile economy, mm. and we don't know, God forbid, maybe we'll be faced with 
financial crisis again or not. And the gap between poor and rich is, uh, is getting uh, larger. So how we can address this issue? It's not a domestic. I, it's a global issue. You know, I, I know the United States is rich with resources. Hydrocarbon is rich. But for one reason or the other, maybe the production is not up to for environmental issue, for political issue. Uh, even you mentioned Iran, Saudi, and United Arab uh, uh, promised the consumer, China, South Korea, and other countries, so what, three million barrels a day? No problem. We give you more than that. But still the prices, and there is no demand. So I would appreciate uh, a good answer. Thank you. <laughs> Frank one. Yeah, sure. Let me. Uh, let me have a shot at that, if I might. I, and he already gets our thanks and appreciation. <laughs> I come from, we have, we have a fellow out in our part of the country named Garrison Keeler, who's on the radio. And he said, uh, I have the ability to look reality straight in the eye and deny it. <laughs> and uh, that's what happens uh, in this country and around the world on this subject that you've raised. There's no question in my mind that this is unbelievable excess speculation in these markets. It's unhealthy. And uh, the president of the Dominican Republic invited me up to be on a panel that he had here at the United Nations some months ago. He's done extraordinary work on this issue. But, um, you know, when, when you have these markets largely captured by speculators, and by the way, the recent studies suggest that while years ago, about 30% in that market was speculators, and 70% were those who produce and those who need to purchase what is produced. Now it's exactly the opposite. About 30% are those who produce and those who need to buy it, and then 70% are the speculators. So we've got people that uh, will buy things they never get from people who never had it, and that affects the price. And, the, and there, there's a lot of evidence on this, and, so, and, and there'll be disagreement perhaps in this panel about it. But it, when we, we created the futures markets in the 1930s in this country, there's an explicit provision in that legislation that talks about what you do to respond to excess speculation. Now, why did they write that in the law? Because they were worried about it. There is dramatic excess speculation in many of these markets these days. It has very little connection to supply and demand. I understand, for example, that when, when something happens in the news about uh, Iran, for example, Israel, Iran, and so on, that, that, that somebody gets nervous and they go into these markets and reflect that anxiety. I understand all that. But I also understand that when in day trading, the price of oil goes to $147 a barrel, and there is nothing in the supply-demand relationship that justifies that. For people who run some of these firms here in this city, by the way, and others who are continually in my office saying, this has nothing to do with us and nothing to do with speculation, is staring reality directly in the eye and denying it. <laughs> and, and the President of the Dominican Republic is tired of it, as am I. And we ought to fix these markets. Uh, markets ought not be uh, subject to dramatic excess speculation without someone intervening to say stop it because it, it hurts the vulnerable in this world and it also perverts the market and we shouldn't allow it to continue. Well, let's just build on that for a minute. I think there's two dimensions to this and I, I uh, affiliate with Senator Dorgan's views on the internal dynamics. I mean, there's unquestionably a lot of volatility brought in by speculation at best and just actual you know, inflation of price at worst. But then you also have external conditions. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I can paint two very reasonable scenarios for you. And I don't know which one I, uh, I mean, I know which one I like better. I don't know which one I believe more. You know, one is that. Um, well, believe mine. No, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm accepting yours. I'm accepting yours in advancing. We need the um, truth. <laughs> well, so you know, two years from now, I think oil could be $40 a barrel or $140 a barrel. And I think the chances of either are about the same. If you look at you know, the basic dynamics of incredible new production that's coming online, you know, much more than anybody had anticipated, and a slowing down of a global economy, and a resolution to the conflicts uh, in Iran and that kind of the risk and the kind of uh, you know, terror premium, um, you could very quickly see a pretty steep decline in oil prices. I mean, it is, it's absolutely within the realm of basic market you know, dynamics that we'll see oil go down to 50 or 60 bucks. 
flip a couple of those levers, the global economy heats up a little bit. And China's growth and India's growth and demand continues. And the situation in the Middle East um, further spirals out of control. $150, $200 barrel oil is easy. I mean, both of those are easy. And there's a lot, of, there's a lot in between. And I really, I really wouldn't handicap them. So you know, when you take that legitimate global uncertainty and then you add the potential for, you know, if nothing else is piling on and chasing shiny objects, um, you could see a very volatile oil market for you know, years to come. There's a, I think there's one other thing about this. You know, we, we always look for a, a, a really compact answer on all of these kinds of uh, situations. And, it, it, you know, the common wisdom was there was about $15 built into the price of oil for all of the disruption and, and horror that's going on around the world. That's the, the common wisdom has been uh, for some time. Um, and so you say, well, right away, for all of this risk, it's, it's bouncing around. And you're absolutely right, Jason. It could go either way. It's done that many times before. Uh, so that, that's one aspect. There's that. Then there is speculation. There's been incredible amounts of studies on this. And no one is sure at any point in time how much that speculation is. So when you get back to saying, how can you put blocks around and say you can't do it, if you can't define who's doing it and how much it is, how can you put the blocks on? I don't mean you shouldn't be trying to figure something else, but it's pretty hard. And the, the third thing is that there's a lot of players in those markets in a lot of parts of the world. And lots of things cause traders to decide one way or the other what they're going to do. Um, going back to the Iranian situation and in many other areas, as you may uh, gather, and many of you may know, you know, if you're pumping something, you can't stop it. Because if you stop it, what happens is it goes back down in there and it's much more difficult to get out and much more costly after. It's got to stay going. So in Iran, if they don't have a market to sell it, currently we know that they are storing oil in tankers. They are renting, there are tankers sitting all over the place storing. Let's say the pirates in the Gulf of Hormuz decide to get their act, their act up. There'll be, there'll be nothing to do with Iran, but there'll be a lot of other people out there with stored oil and, or, or gas and tankers. These are just natural things. So I, I know, like you know, and like all of us know, that there's speculation here. I just don't know where it is and how much of it is. And if the risk factor is $15, I don't know whether that's 15 or 20, because as Jason points out, if we all get nervous, we will see $160 you know, oil. We will see gas get all moved around regardless of demand. It's odd, but the normal, logical, intellectual supply and demand notion doesn't always work. <laughs> In the interest of time, we could do this all day, I'm sure. We'll take one or two more questions uh, in respect to everybody's time. So uh, yes, right here. Uh, yes, one of the uh, great decision topics this year is um, energy and geopolitics, <laughs> and they talked about um, uh, they talked about uh, various countries uh, staking their claims to the Arctic, and the United States seemed to be a little bit uh, behind the eight ball there, not not as quick to do so. Could some uh, one of you comment on what's going on there? Well, there was a. a very nice story uh, in today's New York Times, which certainly talks a lot about the current activities in the U.S. actually led principally by uh, Shell Oil's interest in further oil development. It's moving us towards the Arctic. I think it is a, you know, it is one of um, the richest resource basins in the world. It is obviously one of the most hostile places to develop energy. And uh, whether it is for, you know, anthropogenic human course others, the ice is melting. So all of a sudden now we see geostrategic issues in terms of you know, new trade routes. And, um, and I, I don't see the US um, posture being particularly lazy on this. We're a little less belligerent in our statements about you know, where we're going to you know, plant the next flag. But um, it, is, it is the last frontier in a way that uh, you know, I think causes a lot of uh, good old hegemonic notions uh, in a lot of different countries and a lot of competition. Um, I think you're going to see us, um, you know, as well as Russia and Canada and everybody else, trying to posture a commercial presence there because we think that that's also going to be important from a national security perspective. There's, there's mm -hmm. seven countries vying for space in the Arctic uh, Circle. And uh, everybody thinks they own a piece of that. Um, 
that's going to be interesting from a standpoint of that discussion. We started out with a great example of how we drill fluoro on land in um, North Dakota. But how we drill for oil in offshore situations in the Arctic is the same thing. You sink a well, I mean, it's a, slightly, it's a different process, but you sink a well, and then you run out these lovely little long straws that go out there, and they go into other wells. So you only got one well, and that straw slips it in. And one well can have six, eight straws, you know? So think about this. Let's say Russia's up there and they got themselves going and they got a lot of straws, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's a basin over there and that might be on the top in Canada's piece or Norway's piece or whatever. That basin's going to be empty by the time everybody gets up there. So, I mean, I don't mean to make a joke of this because it's very serious business. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot, of, it is a new frontier. There's a lot of uh, things you have to do to be very careful about how you um, explore in that area because that ice cap used to cover a lot of things that have been buried for thousands of years. And this has got nothing, you know, however that happened, however, because climate's another discussion, however that happened, it's now exposed. There's a lot of things seeping that has nothing to do with the current explorers. There's a lot of natural occurring things weeping out of there, which we may be able, if we get the technology up to capture, and they could become, uh, the gentleman left, they could become methane, methane is, is leaking, there's lots of stuff leaking out of there. So, and it's got, not got to do with people drilling, it naturally is occurring, because it used to be covered. So, there's a lot going on there, and I do think the US, my opinion now, not, I'm not speaking on behalf of Shell, although I have a lot of information there, but I'm not speaking on behalf of that, but my opinion is we, we, sh we should be on that frontier too. This is a country that's always taken on new frontiers. We should be there. And, and we will be there. I mean, yeah. I, I, it is a hostile environment, and Very. it's going to require creative approaches to explore. And, you know, the, the other thing I think all of us probably understand, there are creative things going on all over. Uh, watch McMoran uh, in the Gulf yeah. uh, in, a, in a rig named Davy Jones down 30,000 feet below the mud line looking for natural gas in pressures that no one has ever searched before yep. and, and see what happens in the coming months in the, in the Davy Jones play. There's just a lot of really exciting, new, creative ways to search. And I think whether it's the Arctic or uh, the, the Gulf or elsewhere, I, th I, I think it's going to be an interesting future. Okay, let's have one last question. Uh, I guess all the way in the back. It's, it seems in uh, New York State there's a, a growing uh, movement against fracking, and in uh, Europe it's probably even stronger where it's more integrated in the political processes there in the parliaments. I'm wondering if you see uh, this, this movement against fracking uh, almost on no terms, um, how you see that impacting the prospects for U.S. development and export and so on? Well, it clearly will have an impact if it continues to grow, and I think the, the industry is pretty well aware of uh, the potential of that impact and uh, has to take steps to deal with it, as do state, local, and federal governments. The, we've been doing hydraulic fracturing for about 50 years in this country. I mean, this is not something that's brand new. What I described to you at the start of this, uh, down 10,000 feet looking for a 100-foot uh, uh, thick seam of shale, uh, you know, you're so far below the water line when you're fracking that. I mean, no, I don't think there's very little concern in my state about the hydraulic fracturing. Uh, but there has to be best practices. You've got to have uh, effective regulatory approach. And, you know, most of the companies are going to do exactly the right thing in terms of the well bore. And, and very, but you'll always have a few outliers, and they're the ones that will get the news. So the, the industry has to be very cognizant of concern about these things and uh, and take steps to do uh, best practices and to be supportive of the appropriate regulatory approach. Just for example, the question of, of uh, disclosing what are they putting in this fracturing. And, and we had people just having an apoplectic seizure about the notion they might have to disclose. They're going to have to disclose. Of course you have to disclose. You're going to put something down there, you have to tell us what it is. There's no question about that. So, so, so you know, I mean, the, the, and then the industry, I think, is understanding that. I, sure. And I would say in North Dakota, uh, the, most of the major producers there have said, we understand that we've got to disclose everything. Yeah, and actually, if you look at the, uh, no, it's, it's, it, it is. They'll tell you 
quote what the chemicals are. 99.1% of what goes down there is oil and sand. The rest of it is, are chemicals. The chemicals are things that reduce friction. They make sure that the iron doesn't get in there and disintegrate the casings and so on and so forth. I'm not trying to say this is all wonderful, but I'm saying it's a, it's a small amount, and it changes by geological basin to make sure that you'll do the most efficient kind of drilling you possibly can. Then when you bring up the, the water, and there's water down in the earth, as we all know, salt water and so on, that's brought up, has to be treated. I mean, there's a whole subtext of activity that has to go on here. There's a huge amount of regulation at the state level, at the federal level, as it should be to be doing this, and I agree that internationally and in Europe there's major activity, you know, that is, is against this, but this is a process, as Senator has said, that's been going, we developed it, the U.S. did it 50 years ago, but it's been much more, it's much more sophisticated now. There are many universities and science centers investigating what happens on this, so that it's not like everybody's just doing this, they're trying to figure out how to do it the best, and I don't know whether you all saw the FT this morning, but there's an article in the second section, shale gas boom leads to sharp drop in U.S. carbon emissions. So everything has trade-offs in their activity, and everything should be regulated, should be checked out, should be experimented with, should be evaluated. But this is a tremendous boom for us, and we need to do it right to the best of our collective brains. My, my last sentence is that it's very, very good news that there's natural gas near suburban Philadelphia. Yes. And it's very, very bad news that there's natural gas near suburban Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Because this is, this is mu as much a cultural issue as an engineering issue. I don't well, think, Pittsburgh, it's closer to. I don't think we see actual technological challenges that are, frankly, that complicated. It requires incredibly good industrial stewardship, yep. very good business practices, very good custodial uh, practices, and the consolidation of the industry is actually going to make that easier. And yep. The natural gas industry has been a very diversified, very fragmented industry that all of a sudden found prime time in about 36 months. And some of the folks didn't know what they were doing. And the regulations are pushing them out. And it's an awkward kind of convulsing. But I think that we'll, we're not going to see um, this resource not be produced. I think it could slow things down a little bit. It's clear. Energy does not come without a cost. That's no. clear, for sure. And, that's, and I think that's the, the, the thing we wrestle with as a country. We want it to all have no consequences. It does have consequences. We need the energy, but the good side is you want electricity, you want energy. It creates a better quality of life for us. Let's thank the panel. Thank you.